Good morning, Rocky Peaks. Great to see you here. My name's Michael, and I'm uh, one of the pastors. I want to start today with a moment of silence. It's for the Dodgers. This one. Oh, so sad. So close, and yet so far. Um, another year of heartbreak. All right. Uh, yeah, at least we beat the Giants. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's good. Yeah. Um, so, um, hey, just want to welcome you here, whether you're joining us here in our worship center, you're out uh, on the patio, or even online. Uh, we're going to go into our time of teaching right now. And so inside your program, as uh, I think Kelly mentioned, that, that there's a green and white note sheet. We use that every week a lot, so you'll definitely want to take that out. That'll help follow along. And then uh, for those of you who are joining us online, uh, whatever platform you're using, just go up there and click on top and, and download whatever format you you, you prefer. So uh, if you're all ready, we're going to jump in. You guys ready to go? Okay. Father, we're just so thankful to be here once again in your house and underneath your leadership. And Jesus, you said, come to me. All you are, are weary, you're, you're worn out, and, and, I, and take my yoke, my learning upon you. Become my student, my apprentice, and, and, I, and you'll find rest for your souls. And so, Father, today as we, we come and we look at this incredible passage of Scripture. We pray that you would be speaking to us profoundly like you always do by the power of your Spirit, um, applying your word to each of our lives in particular circumstances that by the power of your Spirit, we would rise with you to live a new life. And we pray this in your name. And everyone said, Amen. Well, our story starts today in the evening, and uh, the sun has just recently gone down. They're gathered together. And this has been an incredible week. The week, the week started off with, with a bang, with a warm welcome. Um, and, and each of these men has come to this place with, with high hopes, um, great expectations. And they're not sure exactly how, how the story is going to play out, but they, they have high confidence it will. Yes, there's been a lot of conflict this week, and there's been some pushback, but they're, they're confident in this future that is coming. Every day this week has been a busy week. So much to do, uh, so much to see, uh, so much to experience. And this day has been no exception. In fact, they've been working hard all day to get ready for this evening. But, but now it's come. Everything's set. They, they've reserved the room. The food has been ordered. The wine has been poured. And as the evening kicks off, it's, it's sort of exactly what they'd expect it to be. It's the way it usually is. There's no big surprises. But little do they know that in just a few minutes, something's going to happen that's completely out of the blue, something that they never could have imagined in a thousand years, something that's going to be shocking, it's going to be surprising, it's going to be super awkward. And it's going to shape them for the rest of their lives. Well, today we are kicking off kind of a new series, or at least a new sub-series, uh, in this, this longer-running series called Signs. And for those of you who are new, a uh, special welcome. Um, but this is a series about Jesus. It's actually an in-depth look at the life of Jesus um, as seen through the eyes of one of his closest followers and friends, uh, associates, a man that we call John, uh, or we know him now as the Apostle John. And so in, at the end of his life, um, John is writing um, his account of the life and teaching of Jesus um, as he experienced in a firsthand way um, and with special emphasis on these seven supernatural signs that Jesus performs before his arrest, it help us to understand who he is and why he's come and kind of mark for us the path of life. Now, if you've been with us in this series, we just, we just finished up the first sub-series, which was called Signs of Path to Life last weekend. And today we're kicking off this second series, Signs of Path Forward. And, and so what's happened, if you were here last week, we watched as Jesus has come into Jerusalem. It's the last week of his life. He's come in uh, on uh, Sunday to the praise of the crowds, this big kind of parade, it's Passover season, the city is packed with pilgrims, and, and he's greeted with this parade of people who believe that he really is the Messiah, 
And yet this week has also been a week of great conflict with the religious leaders who've already made the decision to take him out. They're just trying to figure out when and uh, what, where and, and what's the best way to do that. Now, his disciples, uh, they're with the crowd. Uh, they're, they're pretty convinced Jesus is the Messiah. They, they believe that he is about to unleash his power on Rome uh, and bring in this golden age of Israel that the prophets have predicted and where it will be a time of unprecedented peace and power and prosperity. And they'll be at the forefront of this as Jesus' uh, disciples. But the reality is, is that within 24 hours, Jesus will be dead. This entire series that we're going to be in between now and the end of the year, this entire series takes place in the span of a few hours. On the last night that Jesus is with his men, it's a Thursday night, it's Passover night. It's the night we, we, we've seen the other gospels where he introduces the, what we call the Lord's Supper, right? the bread and the wine. Now it's interesting because as we get ready to go into this first event that John wants to highlight on this last night of Jesus' life, um, it's interesting because traditionally scholars have understood that John 13 and the events we're about to read happen the same night as at this Passover meal, this last night, this Thursday night, recording the other gospels. There are some scholars who believe that this was actually a previous night, maybe the Wednesday night or something like that. For our purposes today, I'm gonna assume that it is this last night. We're gonna treat it that way. And so as the scene opens, John is going to set the stage. It's Thursday night. It's Passover. It's this greatest night in Israel's history, a night when they reflect back on God, how God had rescued them from this superpower of Egypt and slavery and set them free to be their own nation. And they look back every year. And of course, they not only look back, but they look forward to the time when the Messiah will come and the kingdom of God will be introduced where they will be set free from the new superpower of Rome. The men in this room, as I shared at the start of the day in the story, they've, it's been an incredible week for them. They have high hopes the kingdom is about to be introduced. Uh, that's been a busy day for them. We know from the other gospels, they've, Jesus has sent them out to reserve a room to get everything ready. And so now the night has come, they're there, Jesus and them are on completely different pages. Mentally, emotionally, they're ready for the kingdom of God to break into human history at any day. Jesus knows that within 24 hours, he will be dead and they will be running for their lives. They are on completely different pages. And before he tells them, that he is about to leave. He wants to write one lesson on their heart while he still has their full attention. And that's what we're gonna be looking at today. So if you have your Bibles, you have your apps, let's open up, let's turn on to John chapter 13. Uh, there on your note sheet, it's a second called Signs, Shock, and Awe. So we'll pick it up at verse one. So it was just before the, Pas uh, the Passover festival. Like I said, we're going to assume for the purpose of this message that this is Thursday night. Uh, it's the same night Jesus introduces the Last Supper. And so one of the biggest days of the Jewish year. And Jesus, it says, is very clear on who he is. Remember how this gospel began. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Uh, all things were created by him. Without him, not one thing was created. And so Jesus is very clear, John says, on who he is. He knows that the hour had come for him to leave this world, that, of course, via the cross, and go to the Father. And so having loved his own, talking about his disciples, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Or you could translate that, we'll talk about it more later, to the uttermost. And so so John set the scene, right? Jesus is clear on who he is. It's Passover time. And uh, John says that 
while the evening meal was in progress. And so in the midst of this Passover meal, that's probably going to go for several hours with all the traditions and so on. And the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. So, so Jesus knows what's coming. Judas knows his part of what's coming. The rest of the disciples are in the dark. So while the evening meal was in progress and the devil had prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus, and Jesus was well aware that the Father had put all things under his power, very clear on who he is, and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. So at that moment, in the middle of dinner, he gets up from the meal, he takes off his outer clothing, he wraps a towel around his waist, he he goes over to the corner, he finds a, a basin, empty use basin. He begins to pour some water in it, apparently a pitcher there. And he comes back and he begins to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that he'd wrapped around him. So we, we need to picture this, right? This is gonna be a challenge for us, right? We, you and I live in a very casual culture, especially here in Southern California. Sometimes I will, I will have people that are new to Rocky Peak. Maybe I meet them at a next step dessert or meet after a service. And sometimes they'll ask me, um, what, what would you like us to call you? And so um, I will say, well, my preferred title um, is the right reverend Dr. Michael DeYearly, right? Um, and so far, no one's taken me up on that. I don't know. Um, <laughs> My wife calls me that. Other than that, you know, it's a, uh, um, but we, we live in a very, ca and so if, you, if you're new to Rocky Peak, you come to me and say, what would you like me to call you? I will say, well, just Michael is fine. Or if you prefer, because some people are more comfortable with Pastor Michael. If I ever get an email from someone that says, dear Pastor Yearly, I know they're not from here, all right? <laughs> it's like, this is someone hitting me up for something. But this is, this is not one of our people, right? So we live in a very casual culture. It's not super hierarchical culture. Um, the ancient world was very different. The ancient world was very stratified socially. There were certain rights and privileges you had for your social strata, your level in the pecking order, and you would never violate those. You would never lower yourself before, because it's what we call in sociology a shame and honor culture. And, and so to do something that was above your status or below your status would be to, if you're is below your status, it would be to dishonor yourself. It'd be to disrespect yourself. It'd be to, to, uh, to like shame yourself. So, so the first century is very different than ours. There's probably no way that I can communicate. I, I've tried to think of an analogy this way. I really just couldn't. Of what this would be like in our, what we're about to see happen, what it would be like in our culture. And on top of that, it's even worse for, us, for those of us who've been Christians for any length of time because we've probably heard this account. We're familiar with it. But what is about to happen in the middle of Passover is mind-blowing for the men in this room. It is earth-shattering. It is deeply offensive. It is incredibly awkward. And it's amazingly inappropriate. So I want you to picture this. It's Passover meal. We've talked about this before. Remember back in chapter 12 when Jesus was at this dinner in his honor in Bethany, where, remember, Mary came and anointed him. We, we, we set the stage, we, you know, we set the scene, we need to do that again. So, so there were, this is Passover. The, the men are eating Roman style, which means they're eating off a table that's like 18 inches high, um, they don't have little chairs. <laughs> it's like 18 inches, they're reclining. So it's, it's in the shape of a U. The table's in the shape of the U. Jesus will be here where my thumbs meet. He'll be at the head. It's the head of the, the table. 
the men will be spread out around the U. Their heads will be in towards the center of the U. Uh, their feet will be behind them. They'll be leaning on their left elbow so they're free to eat with their right hand. Right? The middle is open to be served. And so it's the middle of Passover meal. This is one of the high holy moments, one of the most important days of the year, important festivals of the year, important dinners of the year. And at some point in the dinner, Jesus suddenly stands up and he begins to get undressed. I'm going to stop there. Right. <laughs> it's like there's limits to how far I'll go to make, help you understand this. <laughs> My boxers draw the line right there. Right. <laughs> Jesus stands up in the middle of this high holy moment and he begins to undress. And he takes off his outer clothes and he's standing there probably in a loincloth dressed sort of like a slave. And I want you to catch this. Every eye in the room is going to be on him like, what is he doing? This is so weird. Like, we're used to some weird things, but this is weird. And then he walks over to the corner of the room and he finds a, a basin uh, and he begins pouring water in it, and he, he finds a towel. There's to be really a long, long towel, long enough to tie around your waist and then still have a lot of towel left to use. And, he, he, and he, he begins walking back to the table as if he's like a slave or a servant coming to wash feet. Now, this is crazy. If you're a Jewish man in that culture, one thing you would never do is you, you would never wash anyone's feet. This would be to dishonor yourself. This would be to humiliate yourself. In their culture, women could wash feet. Children could wash feet. Slaves could wash feet. Do you know that you know, a rabbi could ask his disciples to do just about anything? But one thing that was specifically prohibited was washing of feet because it was considered too humiliating for your disciples. And yet here's Jesus walking back to the table with this basin, the towel around his waist, like he's gonna wash your feet. This is just, this is so inappropriate. What is going on? And I want you to picture that you're the first man that he's coming to. We don't know where he began, but let's say he started at the end of one of the youths. Would make sense. And so he begins to come to the first man. And if you're that first man, you're, you're thinking like, oh no. Here he comes. Oh no, what, what do I do? This is so inappropriate. Like, what do I do? You may catch in the eyes of your buddy. He's like, help me out here. And he's coming closer. And, oh, no, he is coming. And you don't, you don't know how to stop it. You've learned from experience that to challenge Jesus doesn't usually go so well. <laughs> Remember when Peter did that? Jesus called him Satan. We don't want to do that again. Right? And, and so now he comes, and you don't know. You're, you're deer in a headlight. You don't know how to stop at it. And so there's nothing to be done but to let him do what he's come to do. And it's just so awkward. You, you can feel him taking your feet in his hands. It's the hands of your Messiah. The, the hands of the one that you believe any day now is going to unleash his power on Rome. And, and that he'll be ushered in, recognizes the true king, that he'll ascend to the throne of David. He'll be dressed in royal robes. Everyone will be bowing before him. That's who he is. This is so humiliating for him and for you. But you don't know what to say. And now he's, he's got your feet in his hands and you can feel the, the cool water begin to drip and you can feel him now rubbing the bottom of your feet and now cleaning between your toes. And this is just awful. And finally, mercifully, it's over. And he moves on to the next man. And you're catching the eyes of your buddies, like, I don't know, 
Like, what is going on? And, and no one is going to say anything until it gets to Peter. <laughs> How many of you are surprised by that? Like, it's just like, man, it's so unlike Peter, right? <laughs> but Peter, as their leader, he's going to say what everyone else wants to say. But he's going to lead in very gingerly, right? So he's going to lead with a question. Not going to say what he really wants to say. And so when he comes to Simon Peter in verse 6, he, he says to him, uh, Lord, are you, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus says, Peter, I, I know you don't really understand what I'm, I'm doing right now, but there will come a time when you will. And now Peter says what he really wanted to say all along. He says, no, you're, you're not going to wash my feet. You're never going to wash my feet. It's interesting because in the Greek, you know, sometimes when it doesn't really matter too much, but there's other times where, like in the original, it's so powerful. You know what it literally says in the Greek? You're not going to wash my feet for the ages, which is a way of saying, this ain't ever going to happen. And, and so Jesus says, well, well, Peter, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. And Peter is going to do this quick about face. <laughs> like the last thing he wants is, is not to be with Jesus. And so he, he says, well, well, not just my feet then, but my, my hands and my head. He's just blurting out, you know, just top to bottom. And Jesus says, well, no, no those who've had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body's clean. It's interesting, you know, we don't really know exactly what Jesus meant by that. There's different theories. But I think what Jesus is saying is, Peter, I've been washing you ever since we met. You know, when we get to John chapter 15, that analogy of the vine and the branch, Jesus will say that, that you've already been clean or pruned by my word. I think it's a similar thing here that, that what he's saying is that Peter, I've been washing, you know, the final stage is going to come tomorrow when I die. You don't understand that now, but, but I've been washing you from the beginning. We don't need to do the whole thing again. We just need to do this last step. You need to wash your feet. And then Jesus says something. He says, and you, of course, in the Greek uh, plural, you all are clean. All of you, you're already clean. You're all clean. You just need your feet washed. He says, but not every one of you. Of course, of the 12 men around the table, only Judas and Jesus knows what's about to happen. Judas, we know from the other Gospels, has already made, he's already made preparation to betray Jesus later that evening. Judas knows it. Jesus knows it. No one else knows it. And Jesus wants his men to know in the future, to look back and know that he knew it. And so he says, you're all clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him, and that's why he said not everyone was clean. And so when he'd finished washing their feet, he put his clothes back on and returned to his place. And I want you to picture this. First of all, I want you to think this through. This is going to take quite a long time to wash the feet of 12 men. I don't know how long, you know, per man, but you'd think at least two or three minutes, right? At least a couple minutes. Maybe take the sandals off if they still have their sandals on. You're going to wash both feet, uh, probably pretty dirty. Um, you're going to dry them, and you're going to move on. So at least a couple minutes. So even at two minutes a person, it's 24 minutes. Three minutes, it's over half an hour. So I want you to picture how awkward this is. I don't think anyone's saying a word for this whole half an hour. And everyone is still stunned, completely confused over what their Messiah is doing. He's, he's humiliating himself. This is not appropriate. And so he finally gets up, he gets done, and he, he goes back. He takes that basin of dirty water. It's filthy now because he's been washing the feet of 12 men. He takes it over. He puts it down. He stands up and he undoes the towel. 
he walks back and he gets his outer clothing and gets dressed. Then he kneels down, gets back in place. Then he asks him this great question. He says, do you understand what I've done for you? And of course, the answer is no. Like, we don't have a clue. And he said, you call me teacher. You call me Lord. You see me as your Messiah, the great king, right? And he says, rightly so. That's what I am. But now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. Can I tell you, I think this is a mic drop moment. It's like what what just happened was horrible. But now you're asking us to wash each other, to humiliate ourselves to wash each other's feet, the catch is he's got them in a psychological bind. Because if he, as their teacher and Lord, has humiliated himself and washed their feet, how can they say they're too good to it? He's got them in this catch-22. And so, verse 15, he says, Fifteen, he said, I, I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. And he says, very truly, we see it again, right? Amen, amen. I tell you, no servant is greater than his master. It's obvious, right? We know that. Nor is the messenger greater than the one who sent him, obviously. So, so in other words, if I'm your teacher and Lord and you're my followers, if, if I'm not too good to do this, neither are you. And then he ends up, he says, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you, if you do them. We'll come back to that later. So the amazing scene is John opens up this, this series for us. As he opens up this panorama of his account, firsthand account of what happened the last night Jesus was with his men at this last supper event before he's arrested. As he starts it, he chooses to start not with the last supper, which he, he seems to leave out. Maybe that he feels like as the last gospel written, that's been covered already. He chooses to, to not to start there, but to start with this incredibly shocking act of humiliation with Jesus washing their feet. And sort of like the first thing they need to understand as they take over the movement and lead it into their future. And so from this, from this account, I want to highlight three powerful principles that Jesus is setting out, not just for them, but for us as his followers. What does it look like to follow Jesus in this time while he's gone? And so there in your note sheet, you have a section that's called Signs of Path Forward, and three, three principles. The first principle that I want to highlight is very simple. It goes like this, that love serves. Love serves. So I, I, want, I want you to stand back with me from this entire evening, right? And so in the coming weeks, we're going to look at some of the, these, all these important things that Jesus is going to say to his men to prepare them to lead his movement after he leaves on this last night. We're going we're gonna to watch as he says in chapter 14 that he, he breaks the news that he's leaving, which is going to be devastating to them, and begins to talk about why he's leaving and, and how he'll come back for them and, and, and how they know the way. Uh, he, he'll, he'll go on in chapter 14 and he'll talk about, hey, but while I'm gone, you're not going to be alone. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to lead and guide and empower you every step of the way. And he's, he's going to begin to tell them that this, this world I'm sending out to you, that the world is crucifying me, it's going to be hostile to you too. But at the end of chapter 14, he, he's going to talk, he says, my peace I give to you. There's a, there's a way to experience my peace in the midst of the hurricane that you're, you're going into. And in chapter 15, he's going to talk about, about how he's the vine and, and we're the branches and that the key to our fruitfulness is staying connected to the vine. And when we get to the end of chapter 15, he'll begin to launch in more with this hostility that's coming and, and how, what to expect in the future. And 
And so he's going to talk to them about all these important lessons that they need to understand as his followers as he leaves and they begin to lead his moment, his movement. But I want you to highlight this, that where he starts in chapter 13 is the one rule that rules them all. And that is the law of love. And next week, we're going to unpack this even more. But, but here, right at the beginning, Jesus begins to illustrate the principle that we'll get to next week, that for us as followers of Jesus, as we go out into a hostile world, there's one law that rules them all. It's the law of love. That we're to love one another as he has loved us. And then he demonstrates for us what this love looks like by stripping down as a servant and serving them. And this is why I think John starts off this passage there in, in John chapter, on your note sheet, as he kicked off this passage and kicked off this evening, John sets it up for us in verse one. He says, it was just before the Passover feast and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to, to leave, the, leave this world and go to the Father. And the catch is, having loved his own, who were in the world, he loved them what? To the end. Now, this is interesting because in the Greek, there's two ways you could translate this. You could translate them this to the end in the sense of chronology. In other words, he's loved them from the very beginning to the end of his life. Or you could translate it, he loved them to the uttermost. He showed them the full extent of his love. Different translations will translate it differently. But that's what this whole act of service is about. That's what this whole scene is about. Jesus wants them to understand that this is how he's been loving them from the beginning. That from the very beginning, he has come to lay aside his rights and to, to serve them. And he's been serving them every step of the way. And the greatest act of service is going to come tomorrow when he gives his life for them. But what he wants him to understand is that, that true love, catch this, it's more than a feeling. True love is more than words. True love always manifests itself by picking up the basin and towel and serving. And as we kick off this teaching, before he tells them he's leaving, which is going to cause him a major meltdown, he, he starts off in chapter 13, we'll see it this week, we'll see it next week, by, by challenging them as, as my followers, as you lead my movement, as you go out into a hostile world, there's one rule that rules them all, and that is the law of love. And, the, and true love serves. Men and women, we never outgrow this. As we go out into a hostile world today, as our world is becoming more hostile to us today, we never outgrow this law of love. That Jesus' primary calling, his first calling in our life is to love and accept one another, to serve each other. And this is a challenge. You know, one of my greatest disappointments as a pastor the last year and a half is to watch how the church in our country has responded to one another, not just the outside world, but to one another in the midst of this crisis that we've been in. You know, we, we've gone through this crisis, whether it's COVID or politics or race relations, right? And, and what you've, you've seen is the world is falling apart. The world is developing a cancel culture. The world is like looking for a fight. What's the cause I can get about behind today? Hate and slander is the law of the land. But what's often broken my heart is that often as followers of Jesus, we've been the same way. And that often, even within the body of Christ, we have attacked one another because we see things differently, 
Because maybe we, we differ on vaccinations, we differ on masks, we differ on, hey, what's an appropriate response to COVID? We differ on race relations. Is systemic racism a thing or is it not a thing? And how should we respond when, when racism does for sure raise its ugly head? And what's an appropriate response? And, and what's a Christian's role in politics? And what's a church's role in politics? And what we've seen so many times is that the church has been a reflection not of Jesus and, and the washing of each other's feet. The church has responded with hatred and slander towards one another. Christians attacking Christians. And men and women, I'm not saying that these issues are not important. I'm just saying that Jesus was very clear that as followers of Jesus The first and top priority of our lives in the body of Christ is to love and accept one another even when we think they're wrong on on secondary issues. And they're not primary issues. Things are primary. You know, the authority of Scripture, who Jesus is, the path of salvation. Yeah, we have to draw a line there. Say we love you, but we can't be in fellowship. Like we... That, you're outside the fold of what Jesus taught, right? But, but in these secondary areas, it's so important that we model for the world that we love and accept one another even when we disagree. And I want you to think back. I want you to think back on Facebook. I want you to think back on social media. How even among pastors and spiritual leaders, often the the hatred or the slander that spread because we don't agree on secondary issues. Are you with me? That as followers of Jesus, we never leave this foundation. If the mark, as Jesus will say next week, the mark of a true disciple is that we love one another as he has loved us. And that means picking up the basin and towel in humility and seeking each other's best, putting their needs and interests above our own, and serving one another, and catch us, Jesus model by even washing the feet of Judas. Amen? Okay, number two. The second principle is that, that Jesus is the model to follow. So he's, he's, uh, he's washing their feet, but he's very clear about this, that why he's doing this, that he's dramatizing his life, his, his ministry. That, that the reality is he's been washing their feet all through their lives, whether they realized it or not. And he's very clear on this. He says in John 13, he says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash each other's feet. I have set you an example. So Jesus is marking the, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? It means that we are people, that wherever we go, we pick up the basin and the towel. That we are people, and here's what I want you to catch. Often as followers of Jesus, when we think of service, we tend to think in terms of big acts of service, or we tend to think in acts where we're of service, we're specifically using our gifts in the body of Christ. So, so often when we think of service, we we think in terms of uh, we think of terms of like uh, maybe going on a missions trip to Africa, or going to Mexico to build houses, or in some way to serve the poor. Or we think of hey, using our gifts here at Rocky Peak, like maybe we're a life group leader, maybe we're a life group host, maybe we're serving in first impressions. Maybe we're, uh, we're serving in kids' ministry, student ministries. And, and of course, all these are part of the picture of what it means to be a servant. These are all important. But what I want you to catch is that often in our lives, we think of service as an occasional act we perform as followers of Jesus. But for Jesus, service is not an occasional act we perform. Service goes to our core identity of who we are. It's not just about something we do. It goes to the core of who we are. Why? Because true love serves. It's the mark of, it's how you know love is happening. 
is because true love serves. And so what I want you to catch is when Jesus calls us to pick up the basin and towel, he's not just saying, hey, uh, when you go to church at Rocky Peak, make sure you have a place of service. It, it, that's important. He's not just saying, hey, there's, it, I, I may call you to go to a missions trip to Africa or to go build. Yes, that's part of it. But what Jesus is saying is I want you to adopt a mindset where you're living out a life of love. And that means wherever you go, you pick up the basin and towel. It starts in our homes. It starts in our marriages. It extends to our families. It takes in our relatives. It takes in our place of employment. It takes it on the way we serve others as an employer. It takes on the way we relate to our neighborhood. It, it takes on how we respond in our life group, how we respond in our church, that, that for us as followers of Jesus, because we're called to live a life of love, that wherever we go, we're called to pick up the basin and the towel. One of my favorite quotes um, on this topic of service is, is from an ancient work. It's from uh, a Catholic uh, a spiritual leader. His name was St. Francis de Sales. He wrote this great little book called Intro to a Devout Life. But this is what he puts there on your note sheet. This, he wrote this in like the late 1500s, early 1600s, so the language is a bit dated. But he says, great occasions for serving God come seldom. But little ones surround us daily. And our Lord himself has told us that, quote, he who is faithful in little is also faithful in much. So if you do all in God's name, then all you do will be well done. Whether you eat or drink or sleep, whether you amuse yourself or turn the spit, and he's talking about, you know, like that, cooking over a fire. He's not talking about chewing tobacco. Um, he says, so long as you do all wisely, you will become great in God's sight, doing all because he would have you do it. Right. Wherever we go, we pick up the days. The, the, we love people wherever we go. And because we love, that it, it manifests itself in basin and towel service. It's beautiful how the apostle Paul captures this in one of his most important epistles, the epistle to his letter to the Galatians. And so in, in Galatians, Paul is kind of laying out the gospel that, hey, we're saved by Christ, not by our own kind of works or the works of the law. And uh, he says, but when we're saved, we're now free from the law, but that doesn't mean we're free from living, doing what's right. He said, you've all received the gift of the Spirit, so you need to listen and follow the, the gift of the Spirit and live out this life of love. And this is how he puts it at the end of his letter, chapter five. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, you're called to be free. And there's free from all the Old Testament ritual laws. He says, but, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh or lower nature, but rather serve one another humbly in love. This story that starts with the forgiveness of Christ, the reception of the Holy Spirit, and you know, listen and follow the Spirit, it leads to living out a life of love that by definition is a life of service. Number three. The third principle is very counterintuitive. And it goes like this. It's that the life of service leads to a life of fulfillment. The life of service, and we live out this life of love, right, that leads to a life of service, that leads to a life of fulfillment. Now, here's what I want you to catch. Throughout this gospel, Jesus has been saying over and over again in a wide variety of ways that he's come to give us this life, life with a capital L, like this eternal life, right? He's talking about he's the bread of life who satisfies the deepest hunger of the human heart. He's, 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 called, he's talked about the living water that will satisfy the deepest thirst of, of the human soul. He's talking about the light of life. He said that he's the good shepherd. I've come to you, I have life and life to the full. This, we've seen this, this whole this whole. Uh, teaching of public teaching of Jesus was like the path to life. That's what he called it, signs, the path to life, right? This is the path to life. But in this, in this last night he's with his men, he's going to get very specific. He's going to talk several times about this new life he's come to give us and, and the path to that new life in very specific terms. And this is the first time. And I want you to catch this. 
that at the end of this amazing demonstration of humility that shocked them, that's left them with their jaws on the ground, he comes back, he dresses himself, he gets back, he asks him, do you understand what I've done for you? And of course, the answer is no. And he says, I, if I, your Lord and teacher, can do this, how much more you can do this for you? Wash each other's feet, I've set you an example. But then he ends it with this. He says in verse 17, he says, now that you know these things, you will be what? You'll be blessed. Now, remember, to be blessed is a Jewish way of saying that you will be happy, you'll be fulfilled. This is a path to life. Like the Beatitudes, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are, right? This is kind of a Jewish way. Now, this, this is very interesting because in our culture today, really in every culture that's ever been, that, that the goal is more to rise up and be at the top of the heap, not the bottom of the heap. The goal is to rise up in life so that, that others serve you, you serve them less, right? This is the way. It's interesting because... Um, on the way to Jerusalem, we're told in the other Gospels that, that on this long journey that the disciples, remember, they think that Jesus is coming to usher in the golden age. They were actually arguing over which of them was the greatest and which of them would be best suited to take over the top leadership positions in the new government, the new administration of the Messiah, right? And so what we're told back in Mark 10, they'd already had this discussion once, and this week in your life group study, you'll... You'll, uh, you'll study this again. And Jesus did some powerful teaching. What's really interesting is that in Luke's account of the Last Supper, he says a very similar discussion came up again. In fact, it's there in your note sheet in Luke 22. This is during the Last Supper. He says that a dispute arose amongst them, the disciples, as to which of them was considered the greatest. Now, this is so culturally inappropriate in most settings today. Like, like our culture is losing our value of humility and it's gaining an uh, attitude of, of like pride and arrogance and boasting, right? You see it in sports, so evident, right? Watch a sporting event from 50 years ago and someone scores a touchdown, they lay the football down or give it to the ref, you know? Now today it's all about me and... Like, look at me how amazing I am. So we're losing this. But what I want you to catch is that in our culture today, we still really embrace this value of humility to a large degree. Like, this would be really weird if we were out to dinner and we were on the same work team and we started arguing over who is the greatest and I was making the case for myself. That would feel odd, right? Like, I'm really the best. Like, you guys, I, you know I'm better than you. Like, you may be sharp, but you're not near anything like me. And I said, like, that would be really, like, gauche. That would be very inappropriate, right? But catch us, in the Roman world, it wasn't inappropriate. That the reason our culture values humility still today is because of Jesus. Prior to Jesus, humility was looked down upon in Roman culture, culture of the first century. And so it's very appropriate. They're, they're just making their case for why they are the greatest. And Jesus said to them, hey, look, I know the kings of the Gentiles, those, those people who don't know God, I know that their kings lord it over them. They, they love to be in control, boss people around, have people serve them. He says, but you are not to be like that. In, in this movement that I'm unleashing, as you lead it, you're not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest. In their culture, the youngest would be the, the least respected. And the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who's at the table or the one who serves? It's the one at the table, right? It's the one who's being served. Is it, is it not the one who's at the table? He said, but I am among you as one who serves. Now, this is very interesting because we don't know the exact chronology of the Last Supper, what happened when, but it's very hard for me to imagine that Jesus washed feet before this argument, and it makes me wonder, is this argument what triggered in him the decision to wash their feet? T to not just say that I'm among you as one who serves, but to do something that they would never forget, that would blow their minds? 
that would, would kind of sear their souls at a core level, where Jesus lowered himself to humiliate himself to wash their feet. And what's so interesting, though, is what Jesus says when he's done. He says, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed. In other words, this really is a path to life. It's counterintuitive. Everyone around us is going to be seeking to rise up so others serve them. But he says, no, no, no. It's the path of love that leads to fulfillment in life. And the path of love is picking up the basin and the towel. And he says, trust me in this. Trust me. I've been telling you the path to life. But let me tell you, the path to life is a path of love. And the path of love always leads through the door of service. And when you get on the other side, what you find is freedom. You find fulfillment. You find yourself living under the blessing of God that you are designed to live. And the question for you and I as we kick off this series is to what extent do we believe him? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as always, you just challenge us with your life. And Lord, I, I'd be the first to admit I feel like a neophyte, like in the first grade of this life of service. It's so counterintuitive and it's so unnatural for us. And big things and small, we don't want to take out the trash. We, we, don't, want to, we don't want to be the person that's looked down on. We, we want to be the person that's respected. We want to be the person that's at the top of the heap. It's just... And, and yet this love that you came to give birth in us, which was freed us, frees us from all those, those things and really frees us. We find our fulfillment. We find our joy in you and our relationship with you and who we are. We don't need all of that other thing. It just frees us to serve, to pick up the basin and towel and like, like you to find our joy there. And so Lord, as we, as we sing this song about new wine, about the crushing of the grapes, that leads to new life. Father, we pray you would shepherd us, even now, in this song, calling us specifically to what our next step is to learn how to live out this life of love, to we love one another as you've loved us, that we might find this path that leads to the blessing. We pray in your name, amen.